Well, welcome this evening, and we are Western Cuyahoga Audubon. I'm Nancy Howell, one of the board members, and we have our awesome book discussion and for 2022-2023, uh, and our first one of our season is Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid by Thor Hansen. And Drina Nemes is here. She is our host who will walk us through the book and enlighten us about some of the things that were in the book. Um, again, you don't, didn't have to read the book to enjoy, uh, but it might spur you to grab one from the library and take a look. So Drina, I'll let you take it away. Thanks so okay. much for this evening. Thanks, Nancy. Hello and good evening, everybody. Welcome to this, our book club. This is our third year. We began in the isolation of the pandemic in the fall of 2020, and Gloria Ferris and Betsy O'Hagan set up the series. Uh, I joined it and found it to be very fascinating, and um, I became the host just the next year. So glad you can join us. Uh, this meeting is being recorded, and you'll be able to view it again through YouTube uh, in the future. Um, we'll go through some slides. And if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat and Nancy will be, um, will be our chat guide for tonight. Okay, here we go. And just as a preview then, uh, here we are in the beginnings of, uh, we're really feeling autumn and some winter today. But then January 31st, next year in the thick of winter, uh, we'll have our next discussion on a pocket guide to pigeon watching, getting to know the world's most misunderstood bird uh, by Rosemary Moscow. And then six months from today, we'll be back in springtime and we'll uh, be discussing A World on the Wing, The Global Odyssey of Migratory Birds, by Scott Widensaw. Drina, your, your slides are not coming up. I am not seeing your slides. Oh, okay, let's see. Um, I'm so sorry, let's see. What would that be? Uh, um, uh, share, share screen. Oh, okay, let's, let's see, sorry, share screen. Um, Zoom. It's at the bottom. Along the bottom in the middle, there's a big green button that says share screen. You can click that and you can choose what to share. Yeah, I am not seeing that. Um, let's see. Sometimes it disappears. That whole bottom will disappear unless you move your mouse around and then it'll pop up. Oh, it was on the top earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, on some on some computers it is along the top. Mine happens to be on the bottom. Okay. What I'm going to do first, Drina, is I'm going to remove you as a co-host, and then I'm going to add you as a co-host again. Okay. And then maybe yes. that will make it pop up. Yeah, you should have a whole list of things or a whole bunch of things to choose from on your screen. Uh, not, I am not seeing You don't that. have a share screen? I do not. Uh, let's see. I do, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't have that. Well, let's see. Here. Do you want to email your presentation to me and I can share it and you can just tell me when to go to the next screen? Okay, um, maybe I, oh, I have it now. Oh, oh I, made you, I made you a complete host now instead of a co-host. So oh, maybe, okay. that's what, maybe that's what I needed to do. Uh, other, oh, okay. Other times it works at a, as a co-host, but now, I, you're, now you're the hostess with the mostess. Nancy, oh. I'm also a co-host and I could see it. So okay. I don't know what the problem was, but we've oh. got it resolved. So that's oh, good. Yay. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Can you see the screen now? No. No, not. okay. Should I share it? Yes, yes, please. Oh, 
Okay. Still not seeing it. Oh, oh, it's there coming. we go. There it is. Yeah. It, and I'm, yay. Again, so sorry for these delays. Um, but here we go. And we um I'll just move ahead a little bit here. Um our our next book's talks are in January and April. And um, here we are with our, our book, Thor Hansen's Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid, The Fraught and Fascinating Biology of Climate Change. Um, I came across this book because Michelle Brosius recommended it. And I'd like Michelle, if she would, Tell us um, how she came across uh, this book. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Brocious. I'm a board member of Western Chicago Audubon. And um, in that role, I am very fortunate that a publishing company of uh, basic books discovered me and, and occasionally will send me an email asking if I would like a complimentary copy of a book. Um, to enjoy and if I do enjoy it to then um, share it with my network. So I always say yes, because I love reading. And this was one of the books and I, I enjoyed it immensely. So recommended it to Drina for a book club discussion. And I am so glad that you did because I enjoyed it too. Um, I was intrigued by the title and as some of you may know, I sent an email to the author, Thor Hansen, to ask him how he came up with this title. And uh, he wrote back to me, and this is what he said. As someone who wrote a book about feathers and called it Feathers, I'm not always known for the creativity of my titles. This time around, I had the subtitle from the beginning, The Fraught and Fascinating Biology of Climate Change. I liked how that sounded, and also that it captured the duality inherent in climate change biology. As fascinating as the stories may be, all are fraught with the greater implications of the crisis. For the title itself, my publisher suggested I come up with something that reflected the various creatures covered in the text. So I drew up a long list of the plants and animals that I had talked about. We settled on hurricane lizards and plastic squid in part because it's very visual and intriguing, but also because the stories it invokes covers much of the range of the responses playing out in nature. Plasticity, the abilities already built into an animal's genome like the Humboldt squid, and evolution, changes in the genome itself like the Anoli lizard. I have found the title extremely handy when lecturing on this topic. If I can explain the fraught and fascinating stories of hurricane lizards and plastic squid, then I've covered the gist of the book. All the very best, Thor Hansen, and I hope that it will provide good fodder for your book club discussion on Tuesday. So, Mr. Hansen is a well-known conservation biologist, a Guggenheim fellow, a Switzer Environmental Fellow, and a winner of the prestigious 2013 John Burroughs Medal for Nature Writing, and that was for his book, Feathers. His books include Buzz, The Triumph of Seeds, Feathers, Bartholomew Quill, The Impenetrable Forest, and Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid. There are lots of resources for him on YouTube, if you just type in his name or hurricane lizards and plastic squid, you will get um, several um, items. Some of them are book reviews where he was, the, he was the guest and he offers a lot. Then he also has a website, thorhanson.net. And within that, there is a media TV uh, segment and it contains this outstanding American Spring Live series in which he is the co-host and goes around and this was a live production in areas and talks about spring and then he also has several PBS nature shorts and they are just of uh, such excellent quality as as all of PBS nature's programs are so there's a lot out there 
And again, this uh, title, um, the subtitle, Broad and Fascinating Biology of Climate Change. And he says that his book is about the biology of climate change. And it doesn't really get into crisis. Although we have a sense of crisis throughout the book, he's kind of um, an optimistic and positive person. And so the crisis that some of us may feel, which I feel, is not really there. So the word curiosity comes up throughout his book. And just from the very first sentence of the whole book, which is from the author's note, um, this is a book driven by curiosity and told through the stories and discoveries of scientists, an inherently curious group of people. Um, and I just like to ask if anybody would like to comment at this time, if you'd like to uh, comment right now, we can have a, a discussion about if there was something about the book that you, uh, it, it just tapped right into your sense of curiosity. Would anybody like to say something? Yeah, folks, you can un unmute if you'd like and, and pipe up if you, whatever, um, please do. Um, Well, I, I would say that the entire book made me curious. Um, you know, it's just full of different stories of all these different species, animals, plants, and how they are adapting or not adapting to climate change. Um, I think my favorite story, or at least the one after a year of, of reading it, just continues to stand out to me is the one about um the brown bears and how you know they they hunt for for salmon um and let me see here i did i did journal about it a little bit so yeah the brown bears that they hunt for salmon until the berries that the bears prefer to eat become available um and because the, the berries are so sweet and they're just they're just more delicious to the bear so um, the berries have been ripening earlier in the season due to climate change, which causes the bears to give up their hunt for salmon earlier. Um, and then this starts to impact the local um, ecosystem since now these bears are no longer leaving scraps of salmon by the riverbed. Um, other species that relied on that you know, to, to feed on the carrion and even just enriching the soil, it's just, it's not happening anymore. And so I feel that that sparked a curiosity as far as, well, what else is climate change impacting in that way? It's such a, it seems like such a subtle way. So what, they give up the, the salmon early to go eat the berries and you don't think right away that that's going to impact. And if anything, you're thinking, oh, good for the salmon, you know, they're getting out of, you know, being hunted. Um, but it just, it, it impacts the entire local ecosystem from the top apex predator, the bears all the way down. And I recall in that, in that chapter that uh, the researchers are saying that if they hadn't been out in the field, they would not really have known that information. Mm -hmm it was because they were observing that they could see, wow, the bears are gone right now. Where did they go? Mm -hmm. And well, just- what, uh, I'm going to, I'm gonna pipe up now. Um, I really enjoyed the information about plasticity, how uh, among certain, among plants and animals, how different their genes are. I mean, if you look at, at a bird outside, a sparrow, let's say a house sparrow, and you're like, okay, they, well, a house sparrow looks like another house sparrow looks, looks like another house sparrow. That may be true, but you, you're not looking at, you're only looking at their phenotype, the outside, you know, how they act and what they look like. You're not looking at their genetic makeup. And one house sparrow may be a little bit more 
uh, adapted to feed on certain things uh, as opposed to another. And, you know, it does better at digesting other uh, certain things like French fries versus insects versus seeds. Um, you know, which species is going to survive better as the climate does change, uh, whether it's warmer, cooler, uh, food sources change, habitats change. So that plasticity among plants and animals uh, is going to really ultimately lead to what the future of our planet is going to look like. Hopefully it's not going to be like a cookie cutter planet with every, every uh, uh, continent having the same species on, on each uh, corner of the of the uh, intersection, just like, you know, now we have uh, fast food on every corner or a certain gas station on every corner. It, it, everything's looking the same, but that may happen in the future. Those that, that are gonna survive are, are much more flexible in their, in their uh, genetic makeup. Mm -hmm. Yes. On this slide, uh, the bird uh, in the picture is called the crested berry pecker, and it's one of the birds that was mentioned uh, in, a, in a chapter. And I looked it up on eBird because I am curious about birds. And of course, eBird can satisfy uh, people's curiosity to the nth degree. And so uh, I just found this bird to be uh, just so beautiful. And um, I spent more time, you know, looking at it and found out that it has this gold yellow belly too that couldn't see one bit from the other photograph. I, I wasn't able to find out what the bird is, uh, if it's eating this, what's ever on the tree, um, but looks very interesting. And then um, it turns out that this is uh, native to Indonesia, New Guinea. So that's its range. Um, and then um, as they were talking about the berry pecker, it is um, one of the birds that, and I can't quite see it the way um, my screen is set up with the uh, showing um, everybody's faces, but there's a picture there of an older gentleman, his name's Jared Diamond, and then the younger man, Ben Freeman. And Jared Diamond had done a lot of, this is talked about in um, the chapter, Bear Necessities, had done tr tremendous amount of survey work in Indonesia on a, on a certain, in a small area in mountains, surveying the birds and had this wealth of data and along comes Ben Freeman decades later, and he's looking at like, well, has anything changed? And uh, Mr. Diamond is excited that someone wants to, to go back and, and redo this research project. So uh, Ben Freeman does that. And what he finds in that is that there's a tremendous, uh, a, really a tremendous upslope migration on the mountain that Mr. Diamond had studied first by hundreds of feet. So in, in, in five decades, hundreds of feet, the birds had gone upwards in their upslope migration. And this particular bird, the, the um, berry pecker, crested berry pecker, Mr. Diamond had noted that is in the top, near the top of the mountain, but Mr. Freeman apparently was not able to find it. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it wasn't there, but it was evidence that there was, uh, there could be a change and perhaps a bird that had been at the top of the mountain five decades ago has gone somewhere else or uh, hopefully it's it's still around. So I, I appreciate how um, Mr. Hansen it looks so carefully at research and then he brings in so much research and he uh, promotes it and shows kind of the um, 
the ongoing continuity between research researchers and how they um, you depend on each other and so forth. So that was that was one of my uh, favorite sections. And then um, going back to the very first story of the book uh, in chapter one, which is on the whole chapter one is about change. Um, Mr. Hansen talks about his research on the um, almendro tree in, in Central America. And his research uh, showed that despite uh, almendro trees being um, somewhat separated because especially in Costa Rica where cattle ranches were um, taking over so much of the land as well as uh, roads and fruit plantations so that the almendro trees were not near, not very near each other. Now they make a, an almond-like nut that the great green macaw depends upon. So in um, Costa Rica, the uh, almendro tree and the macaws were in decline and partly because of the research on the almendro tree, which showed that they can, almendro trees can survive if there are patches of them. Um, the research that Mr. Hansen did, Costa Rica put a law into place to protect the almendro tree in, the, in these Eastern lowlands. And then what else he found out is, is a little bit of a sideline from his research was that uh, fruit bats were taking the nuts and they would disperse the seeds and they could go, uh, they could go very far with, um, with dispersing the seeds. I wanna get the figure right and make sure I'm saying the right information about the seeds, how far they go. Um, up to a half a mile. So that's, you know, that's a pretty good distance compared to how the trees had been pollinated before by bees. So uh, there, there has been progress. This has been considered a successful because the almendro trees have been moving then back into Costa Rica. There's a stronghold, there's a nature preserve in Nicaragua that's been protecting the trees as well as the the green macaws, so they're very strong in Nicaragua, and now they're they've been moving into Costa Rica, which is you know just a wonderful story. Additionally, those great green macaws have been um, a uh, part of the pet trade, and it, that has depleted their supply. So when Thor Hansen went to Central America. It took him three days going through back country into the jungle before he ever saw a, a green macaw. They were not common. So kind of a success story. And then along in this first chapter on change, um, Mr. Hansen writes about change, that it lies at the heart of evolution and evolution is the heart of biology. Evolve comes from a Latin verb meaning to unroll. Every organism is a product of that constant motion. And then about extinction, that a species wheel into existence, often giving rise to new things, eventually winking out as they, I can't quite see what there's there around them. Um, as the world moves on around them. Do you want me to read it? Thank you. Uh, all right, even if almendros fail to reach the foothills and disappear altogether, that is perfectly normal. Extinction is the fate of all species. I knew this, but still found it head spinning to think that my giant study trees, some measuring 10 feet in diameter, might soon be gone. And that's from page five. Yes. And when I read that, uh, extinction is the fate of all species, I was kind of taken aback. Um, of course, that's true, but. Um, it, it's hard for, I, I don't find it at all comforting to know that species are going extinct now because of, of human action and behavior. And, um, but, but that is the reality over uh, a wide expanse of time. So um, Mr. Hansen has uh, kind of helped me to 
uh, come to grips with, with that about extinction, that it, it is the fate of all species. In the chapter, uh, the fourth chapter called the nth degree, uh, there's a lot of discussion about temperature and the effects of, especially of heat, which we are, we are seeing, especially these days. And there were many examples in this chapter and a couple to highlight were the fence lizards and what has happened with these common lizards that they're um, declining. And basically, if it gets too hot, they hide. They go someplace to stay in the shade. And what that means is if they're out of, they're in the shade longer than usual, they do not carry on a lot of the activities and they don't thrive. And they did find that just, uh, they could calculate 3.85 hours for fence lizards. If they were restricted that much, they stopped having um, babies, they stopped reproducing. And then there's an interesting story also in that chapter about starfish and how in uh, the coast of California, there has been such a spread of disease and uh, the starfish population has declined greatly. And uh, one of the researchers, Drew Harvel, had decided to try to study this. And so she thought she had a, a, a healthy group of starfish until someone accidentally, when she had been keeping these for research, someone accidentally didn't allow the cool water to get into the tank and the tank warmed up. Now the starfish did not die uh, right away, but within a few days, they became very sick and they did die. But what that accident showed, and she was, the research was even kind of curious and glad in a way that it happened because it showed that the starfish died probably because the pathogen in hot water was activated. And rather than the, the high temperature necessarily being the, the threat to the starfish, it was the pathogens that were now activated. And so they died of disease. And the disease was probably there, but dormant in cool conditions. Um, I'm hoping this video will work. Uh, it, it did work for me several times today. And then when I tried it out with Nancy, we did find a bug and that's that it doesn't have the sound that um, goes with the video. It does have closed caption. So I think I'll show it because it's, it's really, uh, it really shows what happened with those lizards. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about the experiment. Um, the researcher, his picture's there, is uh, Colin Donahue. And he went to Puerto Rico and did a lot of work studying these animal lizards um, in order to see what would happen when rats were eradicated from this island. So the plan was study the uh, lizards, eradicate the rats and see what happens with the lizards in their population. Uh, and then what happens, uh, how can a scientist doing research prepare for Hurricane Irma? And then two weeks later, Hurricane Maria. And so, but what he was able to do then, it was a, a, an opportunity to see what happened to the lizards after two hurricanes. So let's try this. Um, let's try, I hope this works. And again, if you can follow the, um, the uh, closed caption, oops, sorry. Follow the closed caption.
Okay. Good. Um, it's a climate change presentation. So um, I'm sorry you couldn't hear the, the video and that it's got some cute music along with it. Also, that video was um, made in 2018. And uh, since that time, um, Mr. Donahue's research has shown, uh, which is described in hurricane lizards and plastic squid, it, it shows how, yes, lizards have evolved related to related to the hurricanes. And um, so very interesting. And um, Mr. Donahue uh, used a leaf blower as was shown there to try to, sh to show people what was happening within a hurricane. And then um, related to the other part of the title plastic squid, um, there's Humboldt squid, and I was surprised to know how large they can become. Uh, four and a half to five feet is uh, their measurements. And we have a picture here too of the researcher who was able to find out kind of what happened to Humboldt squid when the Gulf of California waters warmed. Uh, this was in 2009, 2010. And um, the Humboldt squid virtually disappeared from traditional fishing grounds in the Mexico's Gulf of California, or so everybody thought, until surveys found the squid not only still present, but more abundant than ever. Instead of departing, they had responded to heat stress by adopting a radically different life strategy. They matured and reproduced in half the time, ate different foods, and lived only half as long. As a result, their new bodies were a fraction of their former size, often too small to bite on the lures previously used to catch them. Fishermen had been dismissing the few that they could hook as juveniles or other species altogether. So he uses this as, a, as a, an example of such plasticity that within a very short period of time, this creature was able to adjust and also then to thrive.
The last chapter of the book is uh, Everything You Can is the title. And it is, I think, uh, hopeful and positive and shows how much difference each and every one of us can do. And he, he refers to Gordon Orion's, um, one of his heroes. And when a concerned, when he was asked, what should a concerned citizen do to combat climate change? And he said, everything you can. And then um, Edward Everett Hale, American author, historian, and Unitarian minister said, Michelle, could you read it? Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, I am one, I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do something that I can do. So kind of a call to action. Again, here are uh, Mr. Hansen's books and you may be interested. I know I think I'm going to try to get to feathers at some point. And then um, future, January 31st, put it on your calendar for pigeon watching, a pocket guide to pigeon watching. And then six months from today, um, a world on the wing about migratory birds. Are there any questions, any comments? Again, please open up your microphones if you have any questions. I don't see anything in the chat. So has anybody read any of other Thor Hansen's books? I have not, but I just loved this book and I love his writing style. So I will definitely be checking out some of his other books. I read Feathers and oh. uh, talking about Curious, I learned a ton of stuff in there. Wow. I also, read, I also read Seeds and I was, that one, that one was to me, it was a fascinating book. So, wow. Um, yeah. Maybe one of those should be on our list for next year. Perhaps, yes. He's very readable. It's he 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 brings scientific information uh, to a level that it's it's really easy to absorb it. I agree, and I also like when when a book ends with a positive note. Um, hey, there's something you can do. There are things that you can do. Um, you know, you don't have to be in a certain place. You can do it right in your own backyard. Mm -hmm. There were, um, each chapter has so much in it and I didn't cover all of the chapters. There's just so much, much material. So um, I've read it twice and it, there's a lot to it. Did you wanna stop sharing now, Drina? And then we can see everybody who's, oh, okay. who's joined us. Good idea. Okay. There we are, fantastic. Oh, there's a couple things in the chat. Let's see what folks had to say. Uh, excellent discussion. Thank you. Um, somebody says, yes, feathers, feathers and seeds. Very, very scientific, yet to a high school level of education. There you go. So that's good. And I, yeah, he does write. And was that, was that a kid's book that he, that I saw on there? The, the quill? Quill, yeah. I, I I Bar think it is. Bartholomew Quill. I want that book. I yeah. want to see what that's all about. I love kids' books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing else he did in the book was to include his son at various times, different activities that they did together, like looking for starfish. And um, it, it was a nice touch to see to see that and how his son was also excited about the world around him. Always good to include uh, the next generation. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's your own kids or teaching kids in a, in, in a school or church or 
just your neighbor, you know, grab your neighbor's kid. Oh, well, don't grab your neighbor's kids, but <laughs> they might not like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. But find something interesting and show it to young people and their, and their parents too. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, sorry for a couple of the technical glitches. Um, glad we oh. could discuss this book. All right. Well, thank you so much, Drina. And I hope those of you who joined us today or this evening could join us uh, in the future. Um, also consider looking at our Western Cuyahoga Audubon website, which is www.wcaudubon.org. And uh, we have field trips, we have lots of things coming up. So whether you're local or, or maybe from somewhere else, um, you can join us virtually or in person. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Have a good evening, thanks.